everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of the Cisco Optics Podcast, where we talk about optics for networking. Have you ever wondered why pluggable optics exist? Have you ever wondered what acronyms like QSFP, LR4, FEC, and PAM4 actually mean? My name is Pat Chow, and I'm a product manager in the Cisco Optics Group. In this first episode, I start a conversation with my colleague, Ray Neering. He explains to me how a lot of these came to be, starting from the days of one gigabit GBIC, all the way up to today's 400 gig QSFP DD. Now, this is the first part of a four episode conversation with Ray. In this episode, we start at the beginning with GBIC and SFP. He also talks about why pluggables were needed when they started and a whole bunch more. Check out the notes section for a detailed breakdown. Ray Neering is a colleague of mine in the Cisco Optics Product Management Group and over the years has held senior management positions at other companies in the optics space, such as AT&T Microelectronics, Lucent, JDSU, Agear, Optium, and Lightwire. So much deep experience, I think he knows what he's talking about. For more information about Cisco Optics, go to cisco.com slash go slash optics and check out our blogs at blogs.cisco.com and search on hashtag Cisco Optics blog with no spaces and no hyphens. You can find our YouTube playlist by going to youtube.com and searching on Cisco Optics. And if you find this podcast helpful or interesting, subscribe and give us a review on Apple Podcast, formerly known as iTunes. We're also on Spotify, Google, Amazon, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and a bunch more. And now, join me as I talk with Ray Neering. Hey, Ray, how are you doing? Good. Hey, Pat, what's going on? No, not too much. Hey, th- thanks so much for, uh, for kicking off our first podcast ever. Well, <laughs> I'm happy to be a guinea pig. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a guinea pig along with you. All right. So, you know, we had talked, we talked many times about pluggable optics. This is our business. This is what we do, right? right. Now, you have the advantage that you've been doing this longer than I have. When I, I remember that when I first joined our group, I, you know, I've been educated in like the physics of optics and stuff, right? But the pluggables as a business is its own thing. And I was totally overwhelmed with all the nomenclature, the history, and just the, the form factors and the specs. And because, because it seems like there's always like a story behind it. It's not something you can just look at the name and figure it out. Cause I would look at these names and acronyms and be like, what does that mean? And like, there is no way you could figure it out on your own. You just have to ask somebody or read an article. You just have to know it. So I thought people out there, hopefully listening to this now, would benefit from hearing some of these stories. So I thought since QSPDD is kind of the big thing right now, I would ask you in general, how, how did we get here? How did we get to QSPD? Like, where did it start? What kind of decisions were made in the industry that eventually brought us to this point? And I know that's that may be like asking a lot, but you know, I've got the recorder turned on. Uh, we've got a lot of time. Just go ahead and start wherever you'd like to start. Well, I think that uh, one place to start off is uh, as close to the beginning that I know about, and and that's really you know how did uh, how did uh, pluggable optics start. Uh, in general. And uh, if I remember uh, correctly, that um, what what had happened in, in, in what I believe is the beginning was really uh, GBIC was probably the first uh, pluggable optic module that was out there. But I think the one that was really successful was the SFP. And that was primarily for one gig. And uh, it was a small form factor, had a um, uh, you know, a one gig surties uh, going in and out of it uh, in a single lane. And um, the idea was, and I think uh, Cisco was really pushing pretty hard on this, was to have something that was multi-sourceable and a lot of flexibility around, you know, what kind of reach you would get and what kind of interface there was and whether or not it could be a, a copper cable or an optical module or whatever it might be. And I think the other the other thing that was uh, in combination with that was uh, the various ASICs that were available. So I think if you go back maybe to you know the late '90s or or, or early uh, 2000 timeframe, 
Um, there were ASICs that might have like, um, you know, 40 gigabits of, uh, or maybe even less, uh, you know, a few gigabits of bandwidth. And, you know, essentially, uh, you know, people wanted uh, pretty flexible interfaces on those, uh, on those cards. So, you know, you were able to have a device um, that um, if you wanted it to, to be short reach, you know, you could, it could be a short reach connection or a long reach connection or even, even a copper cable connection and provided that flexibility. I think the other thing that it provided was the ability to uh, be multi-sourced and you'd be able to leverage sort of um, the core competencies of, of, of various players in the marketplace and that there would also be competition between them and also provide the, uh, the flexibility of um, managing uh, the supply chain for volume and spikes and, and that type of thing in, in, your, in your sales. Okay, so I think I, think I heard a lot of things that maybe some people listening might not be totally familiar with. So if I could ask you to go into a little more detail. Um, so you mentioned multi-vendor, which you just talked yep. about a little bit. Um, Surdies you mentioned. Yes. ASIC. Uh, and just the fact that it's pluggable. Like what was around in optics before pluggable? Well, optics the was around, right? Yeah, so the modules that were around were basically modules that you would mount directly onto your printed circuit board inside the switch or, or router. And so those those ports were dedicated to, you know, whatever that optical interface was. Mm -hmm. So if it was a, uh, a short reach uh, type of part, you know, there'd be an optical connector on the front panel. And there were MSAs around those form factors as well, except you know, you had to decide what was actually going to be on that line card or in that box and the type of uh, connection you were going to make to it. And so why, why is that a problem? Why, wh what's the problem that pluggables is solving? In well, it gives you the flexibility not to, not to have to decide what that, um, what that interface had to be when you manufactured it. It gave you the option to be, be able to use that box or that line card in uh, a number of different applications. Uh, so if the connections were very, very, very short, you could use optics that were um, a pluggable optic that was uh, dedicated for short reach type connections that was maybe only, you know, a few meters away or something that might be uh, several kilometers away, depending on how you wanted to use it. So your box, the actual box or line card itself would always be the same. And the flexibility would be around what was the thing you were plugging into it. And why, and why is this flexibility so important? Like, why is it important that you want to be able to select the, you know, the distance after you actually buy the line card? Well, I, I think at that time, and even today, uh, the reach of that, that type of module depends on the type of media that you want to go across, whether it's, let's say, multi-mode or single-mode fiber, and uh, the cost of those things. Um, or, you know, the, co the cost of the transceivers varies quite a bit depending on the distance. Exactly. So longer reach devices generally are more expensive than shorter reach devices and so on. So, you know, really gives you a lot of flexibility. So you have one platform that you can manufacture and then you can fine tune it to the application with the type of optic that you're actually going to plug into it. And then at that time, uh, when GBICs and SFPs were first were, were new, was the pay-as-you-grow model, was that... Was that a big deal at that time, or was it just about the flexibility of choosing the reach? Well, pay-as-you-grow was also a big part of it. Type. So, Yeah, so pay-as-you-grow was also a big part of it. So, um, um, you know, the more expensive optics, obviously, um, you know, for longer reach applications, um, you may not, um, you may need that in some applications and not others, and you may not necessarily fill all the ports that are in a line card. So as you, you know, put that product into, in, into your network, maybe adding on other other types of functions in that network. And then you can plug in more more devices as as needed. So you're not buying something that you're not going to use. So in those dedicated platforms where um, all of the optics were sort of preloaded into it, um, you were paying for those optics whether you're going to use them or not. So the idea here is, well, you know, pay for the optic when you need it. Okay. Now getting back to some of the technical terms, uh, CERDES and ASIC. Can you just uh, briefly define at a high level what you, sure. what you mean? So um, the ASIC is the um, the IC that's managing all the switching 
uh, in on the platform. So whether it's a router or uh, uh, an Ethernet switch, um, there's basically the brains behind it that's uh, you know managing all that traffic. And so that's the thing that sits inside it sits inside the platform itself. Um, that all of these optical connections or or whatever they might be are connected to. And it decides where the traffic is going to be routed uh, depending on you know what's inside the packets in in that traffic. So it's the heart or the engine of the switch or router. Exactly, right? And it's what the you know what another switch has to connect to ultimately through some cable. Correct, or or to a server or whatever else it, it may be connected. Right, to. right. Okay. How about Certes? Well, Certes is the um, the electrical interface, essentially the the direct connection that your um, the physical interface that your that's coming from that brain or from that ASIC to the the outside world, and it's a th basically the um, the, the high-speed um, connection between the module itself and that uh, ASIC. So, you know, back then the Certes were running, operating at one gigabit, and that was pretty common. And that's why SFP and uh, GBIC uh, were one gigabit, started off as one gigabit uh, modules. So basically the, the actual traces on the PCB that lead from the pluggable port to the ASIC would be carrying this one gigabit data. Yes. All right. Now you said you said GBIC was first, but SFP was really the more successful one. I'm not sure if you used successful, but well, I would say that uh, GBIC was was pretty common early on. Um, but the the nice thing about um, um, about the SFP was that it was smaller, so it gave you the, the ability to go to higher density uh, interface uh, patch panel or front panel. Okay. And why why is that important density on the patch panel? Well, you want to be able to connect to as many things as possible, and that that ASIC you know initially may have been relatively low bandwidth, but over time you know as technology evolved, you know those the bandwidth of that uh, of that ASIC would get larger and larger, and so you want to be able to have more connections uh, off of that uh, front panel to you know other switches or or servers or whatever it might be. To utilize the full bandwidth of the ASIC, yeah, and also to have a uh, a broader um, utility for that for that uh, particular product. So if you, um, you know, in in your data center, um, you know, as your data center grows, you're going to need more connections to that data center. So right. or to okay. that uh, to that ASIC. So you have more connections in your data center that you're that you're trying to uh, go from, let's say. Uh, a stack of servers, you know, how many servers are going to be in a, uh, um, you know, in a rack um, to that tour, that uh, top of rack switch that sits on top of it. Mm -hmm. And then there's a hierarchy of other levels that you're going to be connected to. So you can get to maybe other servers in, in that data center or connect to other data centers uh, in your network. So, okay, so we started with GBIC, went to SMP, run one gig, Cernes was also that was the first part of my conversation with Ray Nearing, my colleague from Cisco Optics. Thanks so much for joining us. Next time we'll get into 10 gig pluggable optics. I hope you found it as interesting as I did. If you did, subscribe to this podcast. You'll get to hear the other three parts. Since it's a new podcast, we'd really appreciate you helping to get the word out. Share this with friends and colleagues that come to mind when you think of networking and optics. And leave a review on Apple Podcast, formerly known as iTunes. We're also on SoundCloud and the Cisco Podcast Network and all major podcast platforms. Also, check out the Cisco Optics blogs at blogs.cisco.com and search on hashtag Cisco Optics blog with no spaces and no hyphens. We also have educational videos on YouTube. Just go to youtube.com and search on Cisco Optics. Thank you for listening. This is Pat Chow, product manager at Cisco Optics. The next episode is part two of my conversation with Ray Nearing. Until next time, 